Great. Well, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate it. I appreciate the diversity of backgrounds, too. Um, and we need that uh, and as we're going to talk about um, this topic uh, today. It really is a, a pleasure and an honor to be back um, you know, in this setting. Um, uh, partly, as I was saying to Nick uh, before, what I'd like to do is introduce some ideas that um, colleagues and I have been working on now uh, for a little while, um, but we're at a point of reaching out and trying to build um, a conversation around uh, some of these concerns. And my hope is that um, I will end up walking away from uh, you know, this conversation um, with uh, a number of you know, new ideas and new possibilities for collaboration as well. I have a formal invitation um, you know, to offer um, to invite you know, some of you to be thinking about um, work in this space. And um, I'm happy to, to celebrate uh, really the work of a, a great group of uh, scholars in, in putting the, the book together, uh, many of whom are more directly rooted in capital P politics than uh, you know, I have been academically. Although um, I, some of the best and most rewarding conversations I have had in, in my career were at the time in Minnesota, I was appointed to the um, political psychology program um, as well there, and uh, probably overlapping connections with um, you know, some folks that you know there. So, um, so I'm also particularly happy to be here uh, today to talk about the end of Founders Day. Um, you know, as the university has announced that um, it's going to be no longer celebrating uh, that legacy, um, and as we're going to be moving into a period of um, reinventing ourselves. Um, it's turned out not to be true, uh, and uh, that's something that I, I wonder. <laughs> I wonder what your reaction to that was um, in terms of you know, my, my offering of that uh, comment. Part of what I want to talk about um, here today is um, precisely how we process and engage with precisely that kind of, um, of information uh, and what we might label, obviously, as, as misinformation. I have a particular take on, on that that I want to offer. Um, at the end of the day, I think that there's an argument to be made that at least for a, a half second, um, I was able to get away with that um, to an extent. Um, there was a response to, um, to what I offered that maybe wasn't met with um, you know, a full sense or perception of, of credibility, but nonetheless, um, there's something you know, in that moment that uh, we might talk about. At the end of the day, as we think about misinformation as a larger concern, it's very easy for us to um, Imagine this as a moment where we as a society, uh, you know, particularly here in the U.S., have been invaded by um, you know, this problem. And what I'd like you to walk away from you know, here is, at least my argument on this, is that um, at the end of the day, the problem, at least partly, is us. Um, that there is something inherent in our um, you know, tendency that um, leaves open the door and some vulnerability to the situation that we're in um, right now. I also don't know that the situation that we're in right now is radically and completely and altogether different than the situations we've been in uh, previously. So I want to also make that connection. Um, and I'd love to just hear, as you all are thinking about and operating in this particular space, um, your thoughts about how it is that we uh, in academic departments ought to be engaging in this topic and concern. Um, because this is a, an interesting moment where um, you know, our work is on public stage um, and in a moment of uh, meta-reflection, that we have a stake in, uh, in this uh, as well. And so um, I want to talk about that experience a bit. It's been interesting for us um, you know, also in terms of uh, moving out into this space using that phrase or that word misinformation and all the uh, critique and comment that that seems to invite. So I want us to think about the circumstance and situation that we're in. Partly, one of the immediate responses people have in terms of worrying about um, you know, misinformation is to point out that we are awash in information, that we are, um, you know, yes, there's a lot out there that we might you know, worry about, but at the same time, um, you know, we can uh, overcome this because of the sheer volume of, of corrective information that's there. But I'd also like to argue that, at least in some circumstances, we are um, in a situation of uh, what some scholars would label immediate dependency, that there are instances in which we have no other way, at least for a moment, of being able to verify. Um, this unfortunately was the case for uh, colleagues in Hawaii uh, as they had to deal with this um, you know, strange, uh, and we can talk about you know, maybe the circumstances around this you know, alert, uh, but obviously this is a bit of um, an extreme situation, but how often are we in these moments or will we be um, you know, in the, in the future. Also, as we think about um, you know, the possibility of truth and knowing truth, uh, it's really easy, I think, to uh, assume that this is a black and white you know, issue. Um, and I, I'd love for us to perhaps embrace a, a more nuanced you know, view of this. 
Uh, and in turn to popular culture, even recently, you know, this past winter, I don't know how many of you saw the, um, the movie I, Tanya, um, and I'm not necessarily going to vouch for it you know, artistically one way or the other. It's sort of an interesting exploration, though, in the notion of um, there being multiple vantage points uh, that are credible um, in terms of any particular circumstance. From a communication scholarship perspective, this is something we've long you know, appreciated, uh, but this, this matters. It matters in terms of the extent to which we can be on a high horse uh, you know, with regards to uh, proclaiming the truth. It matters in terms of definitions that we might put uh, around you know, what counts as being fake or contested or, or um, misinformation. And that's something just to keep in mind, um, that I think that you know, moving forward in this arena it opens up some interesting philosophical possibilities in terms of definition. So as you think about um, you know, misinformation and, and its spread, some of what we might, um, what, what comes to mind for many of us is going to be what's happening in social media spaces. And that's not all of what we need to talk about, but it's some of it. And I imagine that um, you know, in your social circles, you have uh, you know, the same response that maybe has been in, in some of my social circles around uh, folks kind of standing on a soapbox and, and suggesting there'll be none of this uh, you know, in, in my um, you know, Facebook feed, um, you know, if, if you're engaged in this, um, you know, I'm going to unfriend you and, and all of that. And in fact, here's um, a uh, recent post from a, a colleague of mine um, who I will remain nameless um, for the moment uh, and who uses this, you know, I'm, I'm still, you know, this notion of babush, it's the first that I've uh, heard of that um, you know, phrase, but she's uh, basically proclaiming here that um, should she see any evidence of uh, the proliferation of um, a misinformation on her feed, that that's the end of the day, or that's the end of the story. She's no longer going to uh, connect with you. And so I wonder if it is that easy, um, you know, if that's all we need to do. And obviously, we wouldn't have perhaps you know, written a book about this if it was. Um, and I think that there is more to the story than um, you know, simply turning away from um, you know, obvious instances of uh, the, the spread of, of misinformation. And so, but that's again a question that I want us to ask. Why, in fact, is it perhaps not as simple to stop as, as one might uh, anticipate? Part of that obviously requires um, you know, a real sense of you know, the agency behind um, you know, this spread. And you're going to see at least part of my comments, I'd like to focus on um, that behavior that must be engaged in in order for this to spread from person to person. And for us to ultimately, um, hopefully, develop a respectful sense of why people do what they do, uh, and to realize that, again, um, there's a complicated situation here that we might, we might think about. So um, you know, as Nick pointed out, I'm, I'm happy to talk about uh, part of the culmination of a series of discussions we've had uh, over time in the new book. Um, and this builds on a number of different uh, conversations that I've had and work that we've done, both in the realm of public understanding of science and health, um, and also in the realm of, uh, of politics. What was compelling to me, at least part of what was compelling in putting this book together, um, this is a collection of uh, observations and thoughts and, and data uh, from a variety of areas. And that was not the easiest thing um, to do, to assemble and, and pull together people working in different you know, disciplinary areas to talk about the same you know, phenomenon. And I'm not sure that we were completely successful even in getting everybody to talk about um, you know, certain key words and vocabulary in the same way. But it was an interesting exercise as a, from an editorial standpoint of engaging and inviting and asking for um, you know, chapter authors to think about and consider um, how other people are using you know, particular language and jargon. And I think that there was a lot learned in that process. And so um, there are a, a number of angles to this um, in topical areas and domains. Uh, we are covering everything here from um, you know, the history of fact checking uh, you know, efforts to satire and ought, whether it ought to be uh, you know, defined in this way. Um, you know, certainly political campaigns are a major part of what we talk about, but we also talk about um, you know, myths in the environmental arena. We talk about um, you know, trying to figure out what constitutes an inaccurate claim in the, uh, the arena of tobacco advertising. There's a real range here. And here's an opportunity for um, this room to actually collaborate and connect. So actually, from my perspective, um, the bit of diversity that we see here, uh, you know, here with um, biology and engineering, environmental science and politics, makes perfect sense from the standpoint of what we just did um, you know, with the book. I don't think that that conversation happens very often, though, um, and so I, I welcome the chance for you all to talk a little bit um, in that regard. I want to suggest that um, this is 
misinformation and, and proliferation is going to be a common occurrence, partly because of the perils of um, simply working in certain arenas. Uh, you know, from a journalistic perspective, um, we might expect that as the first draft of you know, history that mistakes are going to be made, um, that this is part of um, you know, what happens. And, and as uh, Kampf and, and Daskal wrote um, you know, a few years ago, that the peril of being wrong is unavoidable. And so the question in part is what we might do about that, whether there are, you know, the corrections in the newspaper are sufficient to overcome the damage that's been done, um, and that's something that we might think about uh, here, that it's not always going to be a matter of um, consciously crafted uh, fake presentations, but sometimes unavoidable mistakes, and ought we not count that in this realm as well. As human beings, um, I also want to suggest that we are in good company with much of the rest of the animal kingdom. Um, in fact, what we know um, from animal psychology is that many animals can, in fact, be tricked or deceived. Um, and there's you know, good work on this, for example, with regards to pigeons. Um, and again, not to suggest that we are uh, you know, all pigeons per se, but rather um, this is going to be part of our plight, I think, as um, you know, animals uh, with sensors, with, with sensory um, you know, resources that we might you know, need to think about. I want to make a distinction here, um, but rather in a way to offer an umbrella uh, between misinformation and what we might think about as, as disinformation. So Habermas makes this distinction. Um, it's one that's going to come up in some of our ethical discussion and consideration. We might worry particularly about instances in which there has been um, intentional deceit uh, and cynical use of media content, for example, to deceive. And we might think about that in terms of you know, instances where we are, there's known agency um, and, and deceit as being uh, an instance of disinformation. We might worry particularly about that, and we might well be seeing numerous examples of that you know, in the US um, you know, at the moment. But I also think we need to think about the larger notion of misinformation as noise that's in the system, some of which is unavoidable, um, some of which happens as a result of um, you know, this direct um, you know, deceit, um, all of which, though, is potentially problematic from the standpoint of informed decision making. Um, and so there are reasons why we might worry about it. But there are also reasons why we might argue that citizens can overcome um, you know, some of the extent of misinformation as well. As I pointed out in, in my earliest remarks, and I saw at least some of you you're nodding your heads um, with this notion, this is not an altogether new moment um, with regards to, to misinformation. In fact, in, in my circles, um, in, in terms of thinking about communication research, for example, and, and media history, um, there's some very almost foundational incidents um, that are uh, important for us to, to consider. You can think about the, the turn of the last century, uh, right, and some of what is often labeled as uh, an instance of yellow journalism or um, perhaps you know, propaganda in the lead up to the Spanish-American War and some concerns about the way that uh, sinking of ships in the Caribbean were, um, was portrayed. Uh, move ahead you know, 30 or 40 years and the War of the Worlds incident, uh, which is foundational for um, academic departments actually thinking that it, we ought to pay attention to this radio thing because A, you're seeing a lot happen in terms of propaganda in, in Nazi Germany, but even in the US, um, you, know, you see a, a moment and an evening in the late 1930s in which people thought, just for a second anyway, that um, perhaps aliens were invading you know, New Jersey. Now, all due respect to my colleagues from New Jersey, maybe that wasn't entirely um, you know, outlandish. <laughs> Um, but this was a moment where people realized people could be uh, deceived. There is an open jury as to um, you know, actually the full documented effects of that moment, um, but there was at least confusion that was caused. People that tuned in late to this um, story, uh, the Mercury radio um, players were uh, putting on a, a, a play, and, and so this was this audio uh, depiction of uh, you know, the War of the Worlds, um, H.G. Wells' novel, and um, a lot of folks thought that this was happening sort of in, in reality. Certainly in political um, you know, campaigns, we have a number of uh, moments of contention uh, here. Uh, we see the you know, Swift Boat ads um, you know, against John Kerry as being a, an example of that, where folks are worried about the cynical use of um, you know, an effort that was perhaps known to be uh, less than uh, fully accurate uh, in attempting to, um, to attack another candidate. And there are other examples. So part of the question we have to ask is, um, why is it then that we might worry about misinformation as both a condition of uh, the system in which we operate and as something that we might expect and as something that um, will take concerted effort in order to address? My 
suggestion um, you know, here, and, and I'd be happy to talk about and debate that, is that there are at least four really good reasons why we ought to be thinking about this and why we need a research agenda uh, you know, built around misinformation. The first is that from a cognitive psychology perspective, we are biased towards acceptance. And I want to make an argument for that um, here, which I'll do uh, in just a moment. Second, there are good reasons and legitimate reasons why we share what we might label as misinformation. That this is not always a matter of people um, necessarily doing something um, in a malicious way, but there are reasons why this happens um, from the standpoint, again, of, of behavioral science, behavioral theory. I think it's fair to argue that in a situation like what we have in the United States and in other countries, um, our regulatory approach uh, allows this to occur. And what I mean by that is that we are open to the possibility of misinformation appearing on our airwaves. It doesn't mean that we're not going to do anything about it, but we don't live in a situation of um, sanitized uh, information environments and censorship. Um, and I'll talk about what I, what I mean by that here in, in just a moment. And then last, correcting misinformation. We know, based on empirical literature, that it is possible to move the needle back to affect misperceptions that people have. But it's difficult work. And it's work that maybe isn't um, easy. We're not necessarily going to expect that this is going to um, happen without uh, a fair amount of effort. OK, so on that first point, there is a, a longstanding um, debate. We can go back um, you know, a few centuries um, to think about correspondence between uh, Spinoza and Descartes as to the nature of the mind and the nature of what it happens when we are encounter uh, false information. And uh, at the risk of oversimplifying it, at the risk of, especially for an audience that probably has some sense of this um, you know, already, you know, Descartes essentially argues that um, and has a lot of faith and confidence in our ability to screen out and not really even engage with um, you know, fake or false information. Uh, Spinoza um, ultimately might have some faith and confidence in us, but um, is arguing from a slightly different perspective. And Spinoza argues that actually what we do is we process and engage with information, and then we tag it as being true or false. Now, later um, evidence has suggested that there does seem to be the case we're using different parts of our brain for that tagging exercise as opposed to initial processing. So that's at least some evidence to suggest that that's the case. Um, and Again, this allows for us ultimately to discern under some circumstances that information is false, but it leaves the door open to instances of fatigue or other um, motivated you know, bias or other instances in which that initial acceptance does the damage. It doesn't take that long to then for, go from that to click to share you know, with Facebook, even though you know, an hour later you might realize that that information was in fact not correct. So that nuance, um, uh, around our sort of initial tendency to accept information at face value and then to do something with it, even if it's instantaneous or, mom or uh, you know, momentarily uh, after the fact, um, in, in many instances, that's a hiccup that um, is something that we need to pay attention to. Because I think that that may be a part of uh, what we can attribute the situation we're in um, to. Can I ask a Please do. quick question? Yes. So that, I'm struck that that initial Phase. I mean, is that essentially a, like even to ponder whether something is true requires kind of imagining a world in which it is true, and that has psychological effects. Like just that imagining itself kind of true. Right. And so, it so it here's simulates yes, exactly. Simulation and reality. Exactly. So there, I think there are multiple ways to view that. This, if this is the truth, if this is what happens, well, then under some circumstances, actually, people are going to continue to carry that um, misinformation because they're not sufficiently, either not, uh, you know, don't have the resources or are, um, you know, at that moment to actually do the work to um, discern it as being false. Even in situations where, um, you know, you have uh, ruled something out, you still made salient for yourself this connection. The connection of Hillary Clinton uh, with the pizza you know, restaurant, you know, is one that ethically one could argue there's something tragic in that because we all know what, or many of us know what I'm talking about. And that, you know, even though that's ruled out as being true, nonetheless, that association is there. So you might still also think about it from that standpoint. So another outcome, even in instances where, from an effortful perspective, we, can, we know that something wasn't correct, it's still linked um, in our uh, conceptualization of a person or of a, of a situation, right? So the second point I wanted to raise is that we share information and misinformation for various uh, reasons. 
Uh, this is something that I actually wrote about recently um, in a, a medium.com um, uh, column. And this is partly intended to give more credit to and, and offer respect for people than I think we sometimes do. Um, I, there are many reasons why we might um, share misinformation that are short of being uh, instances where we're being malicious. I think some of it happens actually and I think about this, I was talking to Nick um, you know, just a moment ago. Um, you know, I have a, a father who has Parkinson's disease. Quite literally, there are moments when with a shaking figure, uh, he, has, he has inadvertently shared something on Facebook that wasn't fully intended, right? And so that might seem like a silly example, but actually that could happen in an aggregate perspective, that some of that's going to occur. Some of that happens you know, not just with a physical accident, but um, you, know, you might think about this as inadvertent or um, you know, maybe not fully intentional. I also think, though, that our needs to connect with one another are, play a really important role. And this is something I, many of you probably have a perspective on. But I think that um, you know, it's not always the case that we value information purely in terms of its truth value, but also our opportunity to connect with and identify with other people. That may turn out to be a larger goal um, and, and might, might be more important than um, you know, our specific sense of, of factual accuracy. This is something I had a chance to, um, to write about uh, and I've talked with um, you know, Nick and others actually uh, previously uh, an earlier book um, on social networks, uh, thinking about why it is that, that um, you know, rumors might spread. And they spread in part because we're uncomfortable with uncertainty. Um, you know, vacuum uh, is uh, something that um, you know, is a, a great situation for a rumor to spread you know, in. And as we think about information, I think it's important for us to think about it as currency for relationship building, um, rather than necessarily having just inherent value. It's also something that is important for you as you are um, you know, in the elevator talking with somebody or walking across the grounds or um, you know, trying to connect with somebody uh, you know, on, on social media. And that matters. And I think that what happens is that um, at least some of what we're seeing is misinformation gets bound up um, in that very human and natural uh, you know, tendency to try to connect with other people. We see this in the realm of social media um, you know, all the time. If I were to set up a, a contest between furry kittens and a complex mathematical um, equation with regard to housing markets, I, I think I could make a fair amount of money if I'd bet on the furry kitten as being the one that's going to spread on, in Facebook feeds you know, relative to um, you know, the equation. Although maybe with some quantitative analysts in the room, your Facebook feed looks like like that, most of us have seen the furry kitten pictures. And so why is that? Well, part of it is um, you know, thinking about what we have in common with other people and, and why it is that we might want to share information. I also think that there's a role here with regards to emotion. There's been some really important work, a former graduate student of mine, uh, Brian Weeks, who's actually up at um, Michigan uh, you know, now, who has done some work in a special issue of um, a journal of communication that I co-edited a few years ago, and he actually has a chapter in the new book, um, on the role of emotion and anger specifically uh, in affecting um, information acceptance. And his data suggests that anger encourages uh, inaccurate, the, the acceptance of inaccurate information. Um, and so you can imagine the application of that uh, you know, in the current context, uh, right? If you operate from a discrete emotion perspective, then it matters not just positive or negative balance um, you know, on information, but these different emotions are going to have different um, you know, tendencies for us as we engage with information. I also mentioned our regulatory approach in the US. And I, I'm happy to talk about this. I'm not standing up here as a, a legal scholar, um, but I've done a fair amount of work, actually, um, my program at RTI uh, for the last seven years has done a lot of work with the Food and Drug Administration, um, and we've had a lot of opportunity to talk with them about their philosophy towards uh, you know, regulation and, and um, definition of inaccurate claims. And I think that there's a commonality across our different um, regulatory agencies that touch information in some way, in that there tends to be post hoc detection and response, rather than preventative um, elimination of ideas from circulation. So a great example of this is um, the Yaz birth control uh, advertising campaign from a few years ago, in which um, the makers of Yaz made some claims that they shouldn't have. Ultimately, FDA found out about this. Um, I requested that they issue a corrective uh, campaign. But you could argue that Genie was out of the bottle already to some extent. And so this is something that um, I think is important for us to realize that it's maybe a cost or a consequence of the nature of our regulatory approach. 
that we have to live with some possibility of um, this because what's the alternative to that? And that's something that I'd be interested to take uh, to get your perspective and take on that. Well, what is it that we might do about misinformation? I, and I don't stand up here to have w with all the answers uh, you know, per se, but I, I think part of what we need to do is what I've just talked about, recognize why it proliferates, but also think about um, how it is that we might correct it. And um, we've learned a fair amount from the very specific literature on uh, correction. Uh, and this is a literature that um, had its heyday originally in the 1970s um, with a, an FTC, Federal Trade Commission, case uh, you know, against uh, Listerine. Um, and now in the, the 90s and beyond, um, the Food and Drug Administration overseeing um, both uh, prescription drug advertising and tobacco and other arenas, a lot of it has come through um, you know, FDA. This possibility of um, an agency uh, asking for a corrective effort on the part of an advertiser. And so from a research perspective, the question is, well, can that work? Does that work? And we actually have done a few very large scale um, projects for FDA looking at exactly that. Um, and in fact, um, across a few of those, um, we found evidence that yes, you can correct um, misperceptions that come from um, such an ad, but you have to be pretty explicit about it. Um, and what we found was that if you show somebody you know, this type of advertising and then moments later show them another a very explicit ad that says what you just saw was wrong, there was a mistake in that, and here's what the, you know, the correct answer is, you can move the needle back. It becomes a little bit more difficult in situations of omission where important facts are left out, and we find that actually we're able to move the needle back less um, in those instances. When you can deal with something very explicitly, this is what was said, that was wrong for this reason, and here's why. But if, you know, what was said sort of implied this and it left this other piece out, that tends to work actually a little bit less well. We see this in a social media context, um, again, for that special issue of the Journal of Communication. Um, the, a couple of colleagues uh, have worked on this around the development of algorithms um, you know, in a Facebook space, for example, to serve up uh, corrective information in the margins and in the advertising uh, section of Facebook relative to uh, detection of misinformation on feeds. And they found actually some promising results in that regard, sort of fire, fighting fire with fire at the point of contact. Um, but again, there are some interesting um, you know, questions and considerations around such algorithms, and particularly in this moment of uh, consternation with regards to Facebook uh, more broadly. So there are, there's evidence then that um, this can be done. You need to be direct about it in terms of your rebuttal, and you have to fight fire with fire in terms of exposure. Um, so it's not enough for you to have a web page uh, dedicated somewhere with all the mistakes that were um, you know, in a political campaign or um, were uh, in, in an advertising effort, but rather people need to get that word. Um, and so you have to actually fund um, the level of exposure as uh, same level as the original campaign. And that's something that's lost on people sometimes. But um, if you've got a million dollar or millions of dollars in pouring into an advertising effort and then um, you post something somewhere, you can't expect necessarily that you're going to see uh, you know, widespread correction. All right, so where do we go with all this? This is what I'd like to, you know, to talk to you all um, about. Uh, there's a lot of worry and concern that um, on the part of social media platforms, that anecdotal um, insider reporting suggests that some of what's happening there, although it might be high profile, is really a PR effort and um, is cynical. Um, and that actually, um, and, and this is something that I, I think it's an open question. Um, I have talked with folks directly at um, a number of these platforms, and so it's, I, I think there's room still for earnest uh, you know, work um, to occur, and they might recognize that it's in their you know, best interests from a business perspective. Um, but nonetheless, I don't know that we're going to necessarily expect all this to be self-correcting. Um, so what could be done? Are there ways that we could, if we recognize the challenges of this, that part of this has to do with the nature of who we are and, and how we interact with other people, are there tools that could be developed to help us against our you know, worst instincts? Are there situations where we could actually um, improve upon the tendency or the proliferation of this? Maybe it's the case you don't think that any of this is really a big concern either, and I'd love to hear more about that as well. But um, I promised you uh, an opportunity to engage formally. I've had a, a great opportunity recently to work with the Rita Allen um, Foundation uh, and folks at the Aspen Institute uh, to put together uh, a really fairly exciting new forum. Um, and so what we're going to do in October 
um, is bring together uh, the finalists from uh, ideas competition, the call for which is open now, um, for solutions to the problem of um, peer-to-peer spreading of misinformation. And so if you have interest in this, I, I encourage you, either you can read about it in that Medium column, so if you just search up um, why we lie to ourselves in Southwell and Medium, you'll find that column. Um, if you go to the Rita Allen uh, Misinformation Solutions Forum webpage, um, you'll find a lot of information about uh, what we're trying to do there. Uh, we're trying to get people to um, solicit um, or to, uh, to submit uh, ideas. Um, we are open to, there just has to be a nonprofit partner uh, you know, in the team in some way. Um, there's a $75,000 prize um, and another $25,000 $25, prize that's on the table right now and other, a few other foundations um, including, including um, uh, there are actually three or four um, right now that are thinking about possibilities for um, sort of additional awards. And so um, I'd love to, you may be interested in submitting there, but you also might be interested in attending um, you know, in, on October 4th uh, in, at the Aspen Institute. And if that's the case, you know, just being up the road, um, certainly feel free to let us know. I'm also actively looking to find ways to um, ensure that we've got people from all kinds of different communities at that. And uh, one of the things that we've done, um, Craig of Craigslist um, has a philanthropy, the Craig Newmark Foundation, um, or philanthropies. And he's offered us some money um, to offer some travel stipends for graduate students specifically. And we're gonna look to make sure that we've got a, you know, a diverse group you know, there and people that are operating in, um, from circumstances where they wouldn't otherwise be able to attend. So if you know of anybody um, you know, like that um, who's working in a disadvantaged situation or in different parts of the country uh, you, who would like to come, um, you, you let me know uh, as well. Okay, so um, I'd love to shift into some conversation about all this, but I'd also like to invite you, know, you to connect with me further. Uh, you can find me at UNC or at Duke, but um, probably the easiest the email that goes to my phone is uh, my RTI email. Um, find me on social media, you know, either on LinkedIn or you know, certainly on, on Twitter, um, and we can connect and talk further you know, there as well. Um, but I, I'm interested, I'm a very, um, as I always tell the hosts, the guests on the radio show that I host, I have, you know, I think, thick skin, and I, I'm happy to be disagreed with. Um, so I'd love to invite some of that. Um, I know I've, I've been hopefully a bit provocative in terms of putting some of these ideas out there that you might have some counter ideas, or you might have ideas about where we could go um, you know, next, specifically in the realm of, uh, of politics. But thanks for your attention, and I'll, I'll take a seat and we can talk further. So thank you very much. So, people have questions, ideas? Yes. So, question. So, something that wasn't, that, that maybe kind of implicit in some way you're talking yeah. about is, the, is source credibility. Yeah. And, you know, so when you think about um, Hillary Clinton and yeah, Pizza yeah. Gate, uh, is that what we're calling it? Pizza, whatever. Um, you know, if, if I have accepted Alex Jones yeah. as a credible source, right, that's one explanation for why you know, it, it may in fact be rational, right, that if I trust you and you're giving me this information, mm -hmm. right, that's a heuristic that can help you make sense of the world. So one question uh, that flows from that is, well, what do we do with that? Um, yeah. But specifically in terms of these, you know, multiple efforts, not so much to correct in the margin of my Facebook feed, yeah. but to give me information on the source or either within Facebook or more generally these kind of, uh, these efforts to like evaluate and rate the credibility yeah. of different outlets. What should we make of that and, and should yeah. that be part of this mix? Yes, yeah. so I mean I think part of what, there have been a number of really interesting efforts in terms of improving or attempting to improve uh, you know, news literacy. Part of the um, challenge has been that we have this flattened landscape where um, our internet browsers, a lot of things look pretty similar. Um, and that was different than you know, in a different period where um, it took more time and resources. The barriers to entry um, you know, are, are lower now in terms of producing um, you know, information that looks quote unquote. We just say that we have free speech for everybody who could afford a printing press and now right. everyone can. Right, right, yeah. And so um, I, there are a couple of different angles. There, there have been some really good and important efforts to um, both try to raise awareness of um, some of these cues you know, for credibility um, and also trying to institutionalize them. Um, my colleague Claire uh, Wardle um, up at Harvard uh, 
has she works with an organization called First Draft, and um, they've done some really useful and interesting work in terms of developing guides, you know, for people. Uh, this has been a, a real um, opportunity and a resurgence for um, library and information science folks. Um, they've gotten really excited, and in fact, a number seem to be submitting to our um, a forum where they feel like this is a new instance to rediscover a role they've been playing for a while, but here's, here's how we can let you know. Um, I, I think that we could hope for some institutional that, inst institutionalization of that um, in some of the major platforms where um, at least there is a uh, reminder of you know, the underlying URL where something is coming from or something you know, like that. Uh, that could be um, you know, potentially helpful uh, you know, as well. Um, I think the other path through this is, and, and maybe I'm being Pollyanna uh, about this, but people have worried about this um, sort of moment that we're in. And I, a part of me thinks that actually, eventually, um, the, predict, the predictive value of information is going to become apparent. Like eventually, we're either right or we're wrong about climate change. Eventually, we're either you know, there are things that will not that we're going to look back and say I told you so, but um, it's going to be the case that uh, we're going to see that certain institutions are providing information that had predictive value, and I think that this is a possibility. For, there's a, there's a moment here where we're going to rediscover the value of um, of journalism um, and journalistic institutions, and again, maybe that's me being overly optimistic, but I, there's a there's there's market value for credible information, and I think that that's only going to rise. And I think that um, you might see the resurgence of some of those institutions that just a few years ago were wondering if they were going to be able to exist because of some of the other you know, threats. So I, I don't know. I mean, I, but I, it feels like there is room for um, some guides to the morass, that, and I think there's more hunger for that, um, not universally, but. Um, but amongst more people than is realized. And so I get at least somewhat excited about some of those efforts. So, yeah, Lynn, on that, it's on, good to see you. That, yeah. that note about um, what you were just saying yeah. about, about hunger that we're going to have for um, a test that, yeah. or that, that we will value institutions that we, like, I think the story you're, you're saying is about the, um, this moment where we say, oh, yeah, that, what those people from that credible source were saying. We're all right, and we were wrong. Can you just remind us of historical examples, especially <laughs> ones, that, <laughs> especially ones that predate? I mean, I think there are. are like, how has that really happened ever? Like, it maybe happened in for uh, in some communities about the um, invasion of Iraq and weapons of mass destruction, right? So some people, yeah. I mean, a bunch of academics said we were taken in mm -hmm. and we were we should have been more skeptical or yeah. I'm not sure they said we value you know there were these people who were right and we should have listened to them more but yeah. does that ever happen really it, right well that and that's that's a fair you know critique um, I and I think it'd be unrealistic of me to expect you know given what we know um, as I said across the board for this to be um, universal uh, but I I wonder, I don't know, is, is your suggestion that that never happens under you know, any circumstances or that it doesn't? No, I think it could, but I just wondered what the, what the examples are. Like, I think they, they probably, I mean, they, they should be able to come from Well, and so don't, do you think that uh, you know, our historical reevaluation of um, you know, Vietnam, um, yeah. you know, and I wonder if some of the angst and protest and undermining of credibility was partly a, an awakening to the fact that Gosh, for 20 years we were not fully lied to, but there was a sense of that wasn't all correct. Yeah. Now, that you could argue maybe isn't the most um, uh, optimistic moment in terms of, but at least was a matter of a, a bit of a, a, a public opinion reckoning, um, yeah, you know, yeah, in yeah. a sense. Um, yeah. So, arguably, you know, that. Um, I, I, we could sit and think about you know, this a bit longer, but I also wonder if part of the moment that we're in gives more people access. Uh, we worry so much about declines in, um, you know, civic literacy or in other, but at the same time, you know, 100 years ago, uh, I don't know that there were as, um, the widespread access to 
um, you know, some of this information. So maybe there is more possibility for that reckoning to come now. I, I don't know, but it's, I appreciate the spirit of that question, absolutely, because, yeah. So I, I kind of think um, that that set of concerns speaks to a larger problem that we have um, that, that I think kind of raises the question of how people lose beliefs that they have. So yeah. everything we know from political psychology tells us that people encounter new evidence, engage in motivated reasoning, dismiss anything that counters their claims and goes away. But clearly people do shift something about their attitudes over time. Right. Uh, so the question is, like, how does that happen? And clearly how does it happen when there are actors who are motivated to try to get you to believe some set of wrong things? Well, how so this group, how do you, you know, Nick, how do folks make sense of, we talked about the example of um, support for gay marriage in, our, in the talk earlier. As, in my mind, an example of actually a short-term shift that w maybe wouldn't have been anticipated if you thought that things are sort of baked in, um, you know, long-term, but we have seen, you know, a, a change. And I, are those anomalies or, I mean, Converse and others would argue, well, actually, things are fluid enough that you could see um, you know, shifts or changes, but I mean, I have to put a spotlight on you. I'm just wondering, maybe that's not the best example to raise, but I, I, people can, there are moments where, where we make different decisions or we um, have support for different policies than we did. Um. But what's the, I mean, so one way to, I mean, so my, my thought is Lynn's asking, what is the evidence that there's going to be a wholesale increase either at the individual level in the sort of motivation for accuracy mm -hmm. over all the other motivations that are either orthogonal or, in fact, negatively correlated with accuracy, and or what's going to cause a set of institutional changes, you know, like, so the existence of an era where the only information, you know, anyone with a printing press has free speech and you can easily distinguish the New York Times from the mimeograph newsletter ranting about coloration, <laughs> you know, in, I mean, there are a set of institutions embedded in the New York Times and the mainstream media that are, you know, limiting the buffet of information before most people to stuff right. that's, you know, there's this kind of a consensus on what counts as true. Right. So either we need institutions to evolve in that direction, maybe with some prodding, or we need people to care in some whole new way about accuracy over other stuff. Well, and so, but um, imagine, so imagine you have a view uh, where people are operating primarily from a position of, of self-interest, and so attachment to um, you know, different uh, political perspectives or all is, is a, ultimately having to do with you know, your own sense of well-being and, and likelihood of that. You could, there are circumstances where I can imagine that you, you've been duped as to whether or not what you're espousing is actually in your own interest, that for, at least from that perspective, I could imagine circumstances where that seems like a path, you know, that in fact, um, you know, some of what's been espoused actually, you know, is, is countered. I don't know, I, 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 and that's a bit of a cynical view, but I, so I don't want to suggest that people aren't going to uh, somehow, you know, give up a, um, a, a interest in self-interest, yeah. So I don't want to dominate, but no, I do fine. want to react. Yeah, I'm good. Just to say, I mean, so you lost me at people are motivated by self-interest, right? I mean, so, you know, in the narrow sense, like, no, they're not. I mean, in terms of, like, public opinion, no, they're not. You know, they construct their sense of what their interest is based on a whole range of things. But also, I mean, you could think of the project of the Democratic Party since at least 1980 as being convincing you know all these like white working class folks and others that the Republican Party is lying to them and isn't actually in their interests you know if they haven't figured out yet yeah, how yeah. to make that case yeah I thought that was the goal of the Democratic Party since the 1860s right fair <laughs> enough it's always been that. yeah I mean so I'm just deeply skeptical I mean, one of the things that's changed though is kind of media's connection to the Democratic the thing that the Republicans did so successfully was show that formal institutionalized media has such a connection to the party institutions. So you have to go elsewhere if you identify as a Republican, you have to go to other outlets, right? I think that's maybe something that's new this year. And I wonder if there's if it's worth pointing 
making a distinction and thinking about uh, the continuum with regards to, to misinformation as well. One of the reasons I was intrigued by and really motivated to talk with a group like this, at least some of what we're talking about are instances where there's sufficient gray area around, it's you know, disagreement around you know, policy, and that may be different than you know, complete and blatant uh, you know, factual inaccuracy. I mean, there, there's a, there is a range. Whether the tax cuts will pay for themselves is a different thing than whether John Podesta is earning a child sex. Exactly, child pizza right? Pizza. And, that, and I, I think those are different, but I think they're, they're in the same ballpark, but I think we may need slightly different um, stances with regards to those. And I wonder if, and Lynn, I'd love to come back to you, I, I wonder if part of your question is thinking more about philosophy and tax cuts, you know, and, and, or are you thinking also just in terms of actual well, declarative factual analysis. I thought I heard you saying to Paul that, um, that there will be in your um, your wonderful optimism, yeah, which right. we would <laughs> admittedly not crush it, yeah. that, but you, were, you <laughs> were, I thought you were giving an account where you were expecting that there would be um, an emergent hunger for a kind of um, institutional stamp on, on, on accuracy, or that there would be a that we would that we, we long for trustworthy institutions and we will have a hunger to restore them and we will figure out a way to restore them so that we can help that will help us understand what's credible information what's not what? so I, and so I was just I thought that's what I was yeah that's what I thought I heard is, you I, saying right. and so then I was wondering well there must be times when that has happened when there's been a moment in human history where the process was really about um, assessing institutional quality and yeah I don't I, well I guess and I, I, I also operate from the inverse thought about it being as much about discontent um, with obvious misinformation um, and and so may and, and that you know again that tends to undermine credibility or trust and we do see that you know change sort yeah. of over time um, but at least being some response to uh, and and I guess you know rather than over you know hunger to always you know simply be accurate, we know that that's not the only motivation people have. But, but the, the example that you used in responding to Lynn yeah. initially is a really interesting one, right? The, the Vietnam mm -hmm. turn of, uh, uh, of the tide, there the disinformation was coming from the government, right. and we had, uh, as a voice in opposition, uh, among many voices in opposition, right, we had Walter Cronkite, right? We had, and, and the contrast between the faith the trust, the credibility that, that people had uh, in journalism then, and you know, now what we've got is this erosion of credibility in journalism. And, and part of, you know, I, I shared Lynn's response that it's Pollyanna-ish in my view to expect, well, that's just gonna recover, right? The question is, what are the interventions? But, but isn't there pew data, I mean, is, uh, isn't, isn't that a bit of an overstatement about how far we've fallen Relative to the last couple of years, there have been at least a few data points that some, you know, you think about um, you know, listenership or, or viewership or you know, credibility in some of the uh, you know, New York Times or Washington. Like, it, it has not, it's not fully rebounded, but I don't, I, the, the erosion has stopped or there's been, some, or, or you Yeah, a bunch of freaked out liberals after November said, oh, I actually have to pay for my New York Times subscription. Okay. So it's like, yeah, there, there was this little, you know, Burst but, but of revitalization. To 1965. Yeah, it's, we're still in the trough. I mean, I, so I, I share your optimism, except that I don't think it's going to happen by itself, right? I think that right. there okay. needs to be something that is going to help restore the project of journalism, and and that's why I, I, I do think it's important to try to figure out and to experiment with different ways to um, reinvigorate. The, you know, the credibility of actual journalism, right? right. And, and if you think that journalism is not an institution that is worthy of, of support, or if you think it's all just, you know, right. if you undermine it by suggesting, well, it's all fake, right, then you're working against that project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I have a question on the, uh, the studies on correction. Yes. Um, yeah. What were the types of correction that were tried? Yeah. And Great. did any of them, rather than say, oh, that's fake, this one is right, um, do something that was different, like 
asking questions. Um, the, where I'm leading is philosophy versus journalism. Ah, interesting. Yeah. Like asking questions that are, you know, uh, that are critical. Or right. You know, right. Helping the viewer ask questions. Socrates right? as yes. correction or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So the, um, those specific studies um, were fairly large scale um, experimental studies that have strengths and weaknesses in terms of um, you know, generalizability. Um, a lot of those have been in the direct consumer prescription drug arena specifically and were done to um, you know, highlight or to undermine the um, you know, efficacy of uh, these corrective remedies you know, as, a, as a legal mechanism. Um, and so FDA has the ability to ask for um, producers of an advertising campaign to issue a, a corrective effort. There's been legal contest around that and the question is to whether, whether those could work. So that's why we're doing that work. And um, what, there were a number of different circumstances there. They, we were, we had crafted um, uh, market realistic you know, advertising uh, around this prescription drug and it made a couple of claims um, you know, both in terms of um, you know, claims of efficacy that were not uh, warranted and then certain ideas were omitted in terms of you know, certain risks um, and what we found was that uh, if you then expose people to, uh, and we've done this in a couple of different types of ways, um, uh, corrective advertising um, that basically explicitly said you know, what, what you saw in that other advertisement um, you know, was, was not correct um, and, and, and here's why, and then give the full risk statement essentially. It's all about the risk statement for a lot of these DTC ads. So it's, it is um, really focused on, you know, direct language um, you know, that's there, and, and I think that might matter to you. Um, we were invalidating explicitly made statements, but we also were saying that, and so there's some confounding there, because they needed multiple things done in the same ad, but we also said, they also left out part of the story, essentially. There's some additional things that you should know, and we didn't see as much movement um, you know, in that regard. There are a lot of interesting variables you know, that you can look at there. Does it matter if people see the corrective ad right away? They see it six months later, which we did in a different advertisement. Does it matter if it's the same actors or different actors? Does it matter if it's the same or, or different um, you know, literal physical setting or other things that might be distractors or like how many people are connecting those two things? Um, and so we went through and, and found across those different conditions you know, a fair amount of ability to, but then to what point do you return people? Another, like, so we needed to um, understand people's understanding and perceptions of risk with regards to this um, hypothetical prescription drug. Um, we had a third con a control condition where they simply saw the name of the drug and so we were able to get people to a point of um, uh, the same level of perception about the riskiness of this drug as would have been the case if they just simply heard the brand name. Uh, but it, it's another, it's an interesting question, like where's the starting point? Like where are you trying to return them to? Um, you know, and all of that. Um, but it, it does tend to be, again, partly given the, the legal nature of the institution, um, sort of really focused on that, as opposed to encouraging critical engagement, um, which is a different outcome, I think. This was a matter of getting people to accept a different view of the facts. Uh, here's where the facts were, those were wrong, here are the different facts. And I, that, those particular papers don't speak directly to the question of inviting, um, you know, questioning and all that, which may be useful in term, terms of longer term instilling a critical perspective in people or, you know, a, a, are you aware of initiatives that have done what you're No, I'm doing? just wondering. And because I think you know, when you mentioned the, the Harvard guidelines, yeah. um, <laughs> just, it just doesn't seem like that could ever, that, that could actually create a reverse effect. I don't want some elites in, in Harvard telling me how to, how to <laughs> think. So the, the people who would have been victims of the misinformation now are even more likely to become victims of it. Right. Yeah. No. And, and I and I understand that. And in fact, um, in an earlier point in my career, I've, I've done work. Um, you know, on some people won't like the the notion of uh, defensive processing or, or bias processing. You know, against um, you know, persuasive efforts, and again, we see some of that. I, I'm very familiar with um, you know, the the rock we're trying to push up a hill. You know, there uh, in, in that regard, um, and I try to leave myself open to some possibility for for optimism here, without 
tremendous empirical evidence for it. You know, but it's it's sort of a a, a strange place to end the talk of, around. Well, we're doomed. You know, this is, <laughs> and and but I know you all do that all the time, right? So, it's, but I I think um, that's the spirit of what we're trying to figure out with this new solutions form. It's just to figure, um, you know, are, are there possibilities uh, you know here that may help? I'm in the camp of thinking that these are going to be smaller scale you know efforts that maybe are not going to overcome um, instances where this is a deeply embedded um, you know, necessary belief for somebody, um, but rather at least cleaning up some of the inadvertent um, you know, sharing that happens and you know, addressing you know, some of that. So, Lynn? Um, can you uh, talk about um, both for this initiative that you're working up and um, just more generally, how much you think that the problems that you're trying to intervene in are individual, psychological, cognitive problems. Like there's one way to think of misinformation as kind of, you know, part of it is hardwired in, hence the pigeon and stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's like, that could be one of our, that could be part of the focus here. But you also seem, especially in having yeah. a question like that on yeah. your slide, yeah. it, it, in some ways, you seem tempted almost to completely set aside the frailty of human yeah. information processing, and it's maybe it's more of a general institutional slash political problem. So, where in, in thinking about this initiative and just working with colleagues, can you give a, us a sense of the lay of the land and the way that people are thinking about that stuff? Because I think you know, I just think. In political psychology, I think I mean facts matter very little, very little, <laughs> right. and and except in so far as people get dug in around, um, you know that people resist them, and right. so why do we why as, as as political scientists and political psychologists should we even care about yes. information? Right, and that that's a wonderful question. Um, I uh, here's a spot where. Um, I've attempted to bring together folks in different you know, areas, and that I think I have a, a conditional response to that that um, matters a bit as a function of what the consequences are. Now, um, obviously, we can make serious, uh, serious consideration of the consequence of an inadvertent you know, vote or a, um, a sort of short-term uh, uh, misperception, but part of Again, some of this operates from the standpoint of you know, potentially life and death decisions around you know, health risks or right. other instances. And so in those instances, it, it probably does you know, matter even a little bit more that people are, um, are factually accurate. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and so that's, or you know, miscalculations made in um, you know, building infrastructure or other, other things like that. Uh, so I, what I really like about your question is that I, I'm not entirely convinced. I, I certainly don't think that this is the solution for all that ails us you know, politically, uh, mm -hmm. per se. Um, and there's something deeper there. And in fact, it's funny, because as I've rolled out and, and worked with the folks at the foundation are true believers, if you will, in the um, possibility for improving our society by uh, ridding us of misinformation. And part of my take on it has been, you know, I mean, and actually, this is you know, in writing that column. I am at a point of acceptance of the nature of how we engage um, that I think is less urgently focused on um, you know, eliminating this as much as, and so I, I worry sometimes that we assume that that's going to um, you know, fix all of our um, you know, all of our solutions. I just I, I like the notion of it of viewing it as embedded in you know, some of our processes and some of our tendencies, and I think that that may. Um, you know, lead us to a spot of, because I, I, at the policy level, I'm very um, concerned about the use of this to justify uh, censorship. I'm worried about the use of this to justify, um, you know, and, and in fact, we're seeing that. You'll have noted that I have used the word, the phrase fake news in my entire, you know, and, and there's a very specific reason for that. And, you know, Claire and others will, you know, there, obviously that's a political weapon that um, is intended to uh, you know, both make us all you know, cynical, and there's there's a move there that um, the consequence of that is a, a society that I one intent one 
proposed remedy to what's talked about there is a society I don't want to live in. I mean, that's so, so I absolutely am very sensitive to that. Um, you know, two, I just, I do think that there are um, moments where conversations, community decision making, all of that could be improved, clarified, could better reflect um, you know, what people actually want if we could address you know, some of the noise that's there. But I, I'll admit to um, being as open to some of what you're saying as I think you know, where some of you are operating. And I, I don't think that this is you know, the only project we need to be you know, working on to deal with all of the larger um, you know, dilemmas. But it is, it's one that's sort of become interesting in terms of the different players that have seized on this as, a, as, a, um, <laughs> as an arena to work in. Um, and that's what I was alluding to before. Um, I, I, I can imagine eventually us ending up with really uncomfortable bedfellows in terms of some of this stuff. Um, I would, yeah, I mean, it, it, it would be interesting, anyway, yeah. to have that you know, dialogue, so, yeah. yeah. So, other, other comments or questions? I didn't know. Uh, Great. So, yeah. Lynn mentioned the pigeons, and I've been <laughs> <Okay>. yeah. <laughs> looking for a way. So, I mean, part of it's my question picture. is, okay, so tell me <laughs> a little more about the animal experiments. Yeah. But, um, I'll tell you my follow-up question now, or, yeah. anyway. You also talk about, you know, Habermas and, you know, the kind of idea, drawing at least a little and a little more in the written work on the idea that, you know, like objective truth is the, is I know. the big, right? And that really it's just consensus about what the truth is that is the thing. And so if we're, whether you go all the way down into the nihilistic world of no, you know, there's no there there or not, yeah. That kind of perspective strikes me as one that's unlikely, things about how that works are unlikely to be reflected in animal studies using, especially using things like pigeons. And that's fair. And I'm being a little, so I'm, cute. I'm, I'm being a little bit cute with that slide, I admit. Like that's, okay, yeah. but it's a, I mean, so one little, I'm interested in what counts as deception in an animal mm -hmm. study, but also kind of what you think the relation? I mean, so yes. yes. I mean, obviously, it's a little cute, but yeah, yeah. So there's something there, right? Two, yeah, there is two, something. I mean, you two thoughts. Know. Yeah. So on the the animal said a lot of it's around you know um, fooling um, you know, pigeons and so, as to where food is and like those types of things, right? And so, and it may be a bit of a stretch to go much further than that, but rather just to say you know that um, you know folks have a, a conception that's wrong um, you know based on your previous experience, um, and we struggled. And I don't know if we've been fully successful, um, but in the opening chapter of the book, um, precisely around defining your misinformation, yeah. and you quickly get into a, a spot where we are led down a, a road of um, consensus, um, you know, and and that it's interesting because an, an excerpted version of, of this um, American Scientist magazine published it um, in the fall. And some of the, you know, it's always good practice not to necessarily read all of the you know, viewer comments, but uh, <laughs> you know, one of those was, you know, this is amongst the most dangerous essays I've read in a long time. You, know, you are um, leading us down a road of, um, you know, ignoring minority perspectives and, you know, consensus leads to fascism and all that. You know. And, you know, I, I, under I understand the, the critique. Um, and I guess what's been exciting, but also um, you know, interesting about this project, it feels like it's useful in part because we are often questioning ourselves um, and, and have sort of hit the boundaries of the conversations like this where um, we're not on fully sure footing, but that feels like that's exactly the right thing we should be doing in terms of trying to have this conversation. Um, anyway, which is what, it's been different than in other um, you know, parts of my career where you sort of have a, a tested hypothesis, it seems like you've got a lot of evidence for it, you sort of make a career out of publishing lots of papers there. Here, we're almost starting from this point of um, trying to invite people to get on the same page to make sense of it, and maybe one of the solutions, or maybe one of the outcomes of this is to realize, and we are open to that stance, that actually what we are worried about when we are worried about fake news anyway, but at least with regards to misinformation, isn't as big a concern at all. Like that's a, like we we open that, and maybe that sounds like a cop out, but I think that's part. We really are trying to explore that, um, you know, philosophically here. So I I, it's been interesting in that the foundation and, and that work that we're doing is around the concern of you know, knowably false you know, information and, and reducing the spread of that. But that 
maybe suggests um, a value orientation on, on my part that I'm happy to talk about is not being fully confident that um, I just the elimination of this is, is all that needs to happen, if that makes sense. And, and so it, and it makes more sense maybe in, in the, full, <laughs> the full book, but I, we really have, have struggled with that. So I, I, I don't know, and I'm, I, this, I really like this conversation. Yeah. Well, what I, I figured that the you know deception of pigeons had to do with you know the food is under the black right. cup, not the white <laughs> cup a hundred times, and then whoa, well, it's not as I've deceived the pigeon, you know, because it's really under the white. But what that got me thinking of it. So I don't know if it's classical or opera. One oh, of those right, conditionings, right, right. Yeah. right, where you do that. But like the best way to train something so that you makes it hardest to extinguish is not that there's always food under the black cup. Yeah but intermittently rewarding looking under the black cup, right? Because we, if, yeah. if it's always there, then you learn as soon as it's not there, like, oh, that was, you know, that's no longer true about the world, whereas when it's intermittently reinforced, you know, it's why, like, barking dogs don't get better because you yell at them half the time and the other half the time, you know? Yeah. But anyway, um, but, like, that seems to, you know, so that if, if we live in a probabilistic world, which we do, right, like, it makes sense that we develop these mechanisms for learning that don't we don't give up something we believe the instant right. it's not confirmed in the world. Well, that would be chaos, right? Right. I mean, it, it would make operation in the world impossible. And so it does seem like there is something very deep about how we learn that has to have this like bias against giving up something once we've learned it right. until the evidence you know, I mean, if there's a tiger under the, you know, or an electric shock under okay. the, suddenly yeah. there, like, then you'll learn pretty quickly. But if it's just kind of, like, not really true, you know, you'll keep trying. Yeah. So, I mean, it, but how that intersects with, or whether that's even the same problem as the one where we moved from the 1950s, where we had Walter Cronkite, who could tell us what was true, and we all more or less, except that the fringes kind of agreed mm -hmm. that if Walter Cronkite said it, it was true. Right. To a world now where, you know, you read the post and I read in the right. Well, that, what's interesting about this is that actually then, um, you know, so on some level our stance towards this, it, if if facts mattered so much, you know, then I could give you a brochure from a highly credible source and just and be done with it. But that's a part of our stance is that that's not likely to work or to be helpful. Especially, you know, especially lessons learned to you all. So, but the the larger challenge then of well, then why why do you care at all that people hold you know misperceptions? That that's partly a value you know, judgment is partly, but it, assume for a moment that people are um, holding a perception that does not seem to have factual basis and you're worried or concerned about that, how might you move towards stopping them from sharing it with neighbors and continue to hold on to that? Like that's, that's sort of the starting point for, um, for the solutions forum, but it assumes there being value in them not holding that information. Um, and, that, and it may not always, you know, it may not be what determines vote decisions or other, you know, but, it's, but there are circumstances where that, um, that does seem to matter. So, but yeah, that's just good. Um, what's what's the take of you know as a department as you know these fact check um, organizations that are out there? I mean, my old alma mater at Penn is, from, is responsible for some of that. And um, what's the general take on that from your um, uh, scholarly perspective on uh, whether fact checking is is worthwhile or not as an endeavor? Can you just answer that? Well, <laughs> is, is, and is that the consensus, though? That, uh, I mean, my take is better to have fact-checking than not. But thinking, we've created this awesome fact-checking right. system, and you know, and we're going to supercharge it by crowdsourcing it or by like making it pop up automatically, like whatever. Yeah. Great, maybe helpful, <coughs> but marginally helpful because, like, you need people to be. I mean, maybe it's in this philosophical state of mind where they're actually open to sort of thinking or reassessing or are motivated by truth, you know, and that the mere existence of, you know, some pointy headed intellectual saying that's not true. Yeah. 
but it's also a tool that I can use in my negative ad with putting your negative ad. Absolutely. Right. I mean, so I think that's, it, it, that, that's one of the ways in which it gets deployed, probably more effectively than just uh, you know, yeah, on exactly. their news and their email. But it's, but so that's working. I mean, I think that's one way that it gets life, right? Is that it gets. Yeah, yeah. insofar as so fact checkers have not yet been subject to the fake fact checking attack, right? I mean, because. <laughs> but it is in terms of the way that those, uh, the typical framing of you know this uh, being pants on fire lie or whatever. It, there's there is a such a pedantic judgment in the way that that, that I it almost lends itself to being an ideal. Well, yeah, that's exactly how you would talk about us. Is you know, and so no, I get that. I, that's that's why I'm, I'm sort of interested in those as a phenomenon. I'm not arguing for that as like the, the path forward um, you know, here. Uh, you know, but I, I was just curious with the. The senses. Yeah. But, you know, it's also, I, I think their existence is in some ways um, a, an acknowledgement of a failure of journalism, right? Yeah. Because yeah. why do you need them if right. journalism is doing their job, right? Like, and journalism has the institutional location within the society right. of culture that it times for. In well, that's right. That's the main thing, right? If people, I don't need to turn to the fact check column, right? If I'm reading the News account that is you know, debunking the inaccurate statements. Yeah, I'm on a factcheck.org site about the claim that Snopes is an extremely liberal propaganda machine. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's a very bad. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and there's probably a Snopes site about the fact check is. Brian, could you talk about the um, about the you know going back to the like defining misinformation and yeah. especially I was thinking about the the kind of science engineering people who yeah. are in the room and can we think for a moment about the a set of misinformation that concerns us most and I was, I was trying to brainstorm about it a little bit myself and I was thinking that maybe there's a class of things that engage mortality in a direct way that. Yeah. Um, or you know, really, are, are threats to the survival of individuals or to well, we, species? We, we talked. We talked yeah. a little bit this morning. I actually love to invite you know, some other folks in you know, to think about some of those examples. But um, you know, actually, uh, an area that you all are probably familiar with too. But you know, debates around you know vaccines or other instances yeah. like that, where yeah, yeah. there are important consequences for you know, people's acceptance or not, you know, of of that. Um, you know, and even uh, just in terms of you know, engagement with uh, you know, disease screening or you know other other things you know, like that. Um, I was talking this morning about um, Zika virus, and uh, there's some aspects of its transmission. You know, it's a mosquito-borne disease, but actually sexually transmitted. And there are myths around you know, some of that that you know, if one didn't take precautionary steps, well, then you've got consequences at least from a public health standpoint yeah, yeah. You know, for us. Yeah. So, and it may be easier to see some of our interests when framed from those, from that, mm -hmm. those consequences. Yeah. And admittedly, that's where I've come to some of this from. Um, yeah. And so, but it also seems silly for me to ignore, um, you know, the civic arena. But it, but those chapters in the book are more complicated. And thinking about the outcomes and consequences, it, it's. I, I just I feel like it ought not to be cordoned off um, and, and limited only to those, um, but but maybe they are qualitatively different. You know, well, I think remembering those kinds of examples I think really troubles um, a glib statement like one I made earlier of you know whoa political psychology has you know nothing to do with information and huh? so I think there's probably a, a class of problems yeah. that um, <coughs> scientists all the scientists in the room yeah. share or have, share an interest in that's that have something to do with yeah. something like mortal threats. And, um, and I mean, there, it seems like there's some political debates that must be, must turn in a, a very important way on collective agreement on something close to objective truth. Well, and, yeah, yeah, I mean, I think insofar as, so if you're making a values-based decision about a political candidate that has to do with their character, 
and there's something that's factually false about, I, or I don't know, I, that could have consequence anyway. I mean, yeah. right? Yeah, but it does, but it seems to me like it's not as important as what these guys work on. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, yeah. it's. I don't know if there's a yeah. value <laughs> assignment there <laughs> that says one is more important than the other. <laughs> well, I was trying to make it because I think. Yeah. yeah. I, I was wondering if we should explore that. It seems. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know what what I mean. Others, you know, think. About, I mean, because as you all think, or worry about myths, misperceptions, misinformation. Like, are, I mean, there are lots of prominent examples. I think you know, day in day out, where you all worry about um, you know inaccuracy of reporting or other things. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. I think. I mean, I, I'll talk from a science perspective. Yeah. I'm not currently practicing science, but or biology. Um, I think a, a common problem is that you have to produce data that's replicable to anyone. Mm -hmm. They should be able to read your paper, use the same reagents, and get the same results. A lot of times that's very difficult to do because there's different environments, like there's different water being used in the experiments. Um, you know, there's these little intricacies that make it difficult. And so I think I've seen in the past few years in the field that there have been a lot of issues with publications coming out and people questioning, well, I can't repeat this in my lab, so it must not be true. So there's actually, I mean, I've also seen a rise in um, retracted articles because it can't, things can't be repeated. But um, so yeah, I mean, even I think scientists are, you know, question, you know, how do we, how do we produce data that is believable to everybody? Right. Well, right. to that point, it's within within the scientific community, and then between the scientific community and to the public, the public. Yeah, and that's a real. I think a real, become a real problem, and I think people have in the science community have discussed this, and you know, how do we how do we address this? Like, how do we show? You know, there are sci bad scientists who might be lying about their data just because their our motto is publish or perish, and right. so you have to get those pubs out, and. But also, on the other hand, too, the review process has become very difficult. It's very hard to publish. Like they've become much more strict, and yeah. So there's there's also a, within the science community a whole whole same kind of maybe misinformation kind of I want going uh, on. Just to build on that, what if folks in this room you know, think about climate change? Right. <laughs> about what? Climate change. Oh yeah. yeah. I know. So. I, I don't know. I've heard interesting takes on, um, from time series perspective, actually. What, now it's interesting because there's irony in this, I suppose, because um, you know the the likelihood of any one incident actually reflecting you know, climate change is an open issue. But you know, impact of hurricanes on perceptions of um, you know climate change science. I, and I, I just, I, what I had in mind, you know, Linda, as I think about that moment where predictive value is going to matter, 30 years from now, would we see a generation where some of this debate has fallen away because some of what was predicted has come to pass? Mm. You know, Wilmington's underwater or, you know, or whatever. And I, I don't know. Like that, I just wonder what we will all do t when there's objective um, uh, evidence of predictions that were made. Like, mm -hmm. would that, is that have the possibility for tragically restoring or, yeah. or building our confidence in, well, you know what I mean? That, yeah. That's really, that's the <laughs> most animated example. I mean, it's a tragic circumstance, but I, you know, but I, I don't know, Nick, what were you going to say? No, I, that's super interesting. I mean, I'm, you know, was it a town in Virginia or the state that, like, passed a law that, you know, thou shalt not study climate, you know? In North, North Carolina, we can't. Um, there are certain things that are, are banned in terms of you know, reports on uh, you know, the amount of um, uh, yeah, elevation of, of sea, sea water and all right. that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but no, what I was going to say is I think the, the replication um, point and sort of the issues of replication, which you know, psychology is dealing with <laughs> yes, as, right. as well. Um, yeah. I wonder if there's a distinction to be made in the realm of replication that also then might be a useful distinction about information and disinformation more generally between, you know, there's the devious scientist who either just wholesale makes up the data or kind of more or less knowingly 
you know, or malpracticely, you know, kind of fabricating more or less data on the one hand. And then there's like research reports on findings that really did occur, but don't replicate, which we could think of as a problem of generalizability, right? It yeah. turns right. out that, you know, that particular finding is conditional on the pH and 12 other things about the water and, you know, what kind of lighting there was in the lab and, you know, what all these other things that like our theory doesn't take account of, but which in fact are set conditions on, you know, and lots of the psychological stuff that I'm much more familiar with kind of has that, you know, it turns out that the undergrads in that class on that day really did react this way, but <laughs> right. you know, that doesn't mean all people in all times and all places will react that way. They're ready to start pickles. <laughs> yeah, right. So, but the, like, but that's a sort of what are the scope conditions as opposed to, you know, kind of fake research where it's been. I, so yeah. I don't, yeah, yeah. I don't have anywhere to go with that other than to wonder if we could rethink of. I mean, is is I I don't know. So where where the Hillary Clinton was running the pedophile ring. Yeah. Is maybe more like the scientist. Up, you know, because right. the woman know yeah. to save cigarette. Yeah. yeah. Well, Whereas, you know, Donald Trump cares more about you than Hillary Clinton does. And that's actually part of the problem with the lazy move to you know use fake news to label uh, something that's threatening to you, or you disagree with. Like it's because it it. Yeah, it, collapses. it collapses things but, yeah. when in fact we need to move to I actually think there are situations and nuances and circumstances <coughs> where this matters but the broader you know, we have to invite people in with the broader buzzword uh, to the topic but I actually don't think that in all circumstances it's equivalent I think that's exactly right I think that's the, the important but I think the, what's, what's fascinating about this is that this is you know, a few years in the works but now it's sort of moved into popular discourse about fake news, about misinformation, and it's all a sort of funhouse mirrors in terms of trying to, because we, we're getting pulled into all of that, which is done for rhetorical or political purposes, and when in fact, you know, from a careful scientific viewpoint, we'd want to be making these distinctions and sort of suggest, and, and, and all of that, and it's, I don't know. It's just a it's a weird moment. I don't. Think <laughs> any of you who've been in situations, I'm, I'm sure many of you have, where you study buzzword topics. You're dealing with it in a very carefully defined in a way, but public discourse sort of comes along and sweeps that. And it's I guess it's good. I mean, it's good for us to be in, but it it's hard because it's actually affected even conversations like this. You know, we're all sort of thinking about um, you know news stories about it or other things. When we started this out, you know. We were talking about this before Trump was like it was before, you know, like, and that was, you know what I mean? It, it's it's interesting, um, just as a as a phenomenon. So uh, great. I'm curious. Um, so I'm I'm a little bit naive to political psychology, yeah. um, <laughs> but thinking about just the evolution of news itself over the past few decades and what is news relative to this conversation about you know, information and misinformation 40 years ago versus today, it, it feels like a, we're comparing apples to oranges more than apples to apples because news itself has evolved as a thing. And so I'm, I'm curious how that plays in here. I think it, I think it matters. You know, I mean, it, so I try to reach back a bit in terms of historical circumstances. I mean, Lynn invited us to think about you know, that too, but I... Uh, that is a part of the discussion we didn't really get into very much, how much the technology landscape um, affects and complicates what we're, what we're talking about and, and shifts in terms of um, you know, what constitutes a news outlet you know, or any of that. Even, even reporting versus opinion yeah. um, seems to be a little squishy. And it, some of it is intentional evolution, some of it is just drastic changes in budgets and infrastructure so that some of the work's just sloppier. I mean, honestly, well, the expectations have changed. Yeah. yeah, you know, BuzzFeed or whatever is being, you know, and think or often post or all that counting in this sort of quasi space. It used to be, you know, the sort of elementary school definition of fact and opinion. It was easier to make that distinction, and it all that's a mess now. I mean, it's um, it partly catering to our interests and desires and preferences as consumers, partly as a function of big changes in the, um, you know, 
in the marketplace just in terms of those institutions and, and their, yeah. I don't, I don't know, as you all think about mass media, is that, it's such a, it's a more complicated, you know, it used to be an easier, you know, so there's a line of thinking in politics and, you know, to, uh, in political communication, but now it, it's, I don't know, it's, it's a grayer, a fuzzier on boundaries, and, uh, right? You know, and there used to be, um, you, know, you could think about folks that were doing work in interpersonal, and folks that were doing work in mass communication, and well, <laughs> now all of that sort of <laughs> yeah. merged, right? That's really hard, too, um, you know, for a lot of people to deal with. Yeah, that's a great insight. It's not naive at all. It's actually, I don't think people have figured it out yet. <laughs> this part of the answer. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm wondering. Um, Thanks for stopping by. How, how much, um, you know, putting a, too high a hurdle on science and or putting too high a hurdle on journalism. Um, so I'm thinking about climate change or, um, you know, and drawing the line between a fact and opinion, drawing the line between science and politics, or between politics and religion, or science and religion, and when science is supposed to be something that's absolutely, you know, uh, beyond critique, uh, and journalism is supposed to be something beyond critique, when that has a reverse effect. So, I mean, this is like, uh, Bruno Latour's argument. Yes, um, right, yeah, good, yeah. Yes, yeah, so I'm wondering you know, how much is that happening here and how does one, um, because it's about acting, right, that we have to act uh, based on probabilistic scientific reasoning as to whether or not we should build a new coal plant mm -hmm. uh, rather than based on this folk notion of science which I don't know why it's, that still seems to be true today. Folk notion of science as in it's about 100% fact, and if there's any kind of doubt in it, then it's just opinion. Right, right. Yeah, no, I, so there's, it springs to mind so much. Um, my old uh, mentor, Elihu Katz at, at Penn, had a, um, what turned out to be just a really struggle of a conference on uh, the future of fact, and sort of you know, thinking about <laughs> So all that, it never fully, I mean, it seems so promising, and then it sort of went down all these different rabbit holes, and it was, it was really difficult. But um, we, we had a really interesting discussion uh, this morning, partly in the importance, in terms of long-term credibility of the institutions, putting more of a spotlight on the um, human actors in science and also the fallibility of science, and that there's a really big risk with um, public, Misunderstanding of the reality of scientific processes, um, and that part we what we need to do is actually probably admit to more flaws as a way of humanizing, but also suggesting that there are good reasons why people are still endeavoring to do this work. And and all I think it relates to what you were saying. It's sort of the um, there's a risk in the pristine notion um, that is probably inadvertent, but that has really caused more trouble than it's worth because it, it makes it almost more fragile. It's easier to, right? It's like, oh gosh, what do you mean this? We couldn't replicate that, so I get the whole thing. As opposed to viewing it as a long-term, evolutionary, iterative, messy process that's well-intentioned to try to help us all. You know, it's, you know, so it's, um, yeah, there's an interesting connection there, I think, anyway. I don't know if that, that's yeah, the and comment. And the jury makes a decision based on uh, the preponderance of the evidence, not based on 100 percent right. uh, certainty. Yeah, yeah. And if you go onto the Washington Post monkey page and there's political scientists tell me this is, in fact, the reason it is. It <laughs> is, it is, it is. But it gets to the point of media is no longer mediating things. We as producers of content and scientific knowledge. I think that's part of the problem. We're just putting it out there well, I, directly. I, I mean, I so I, I've done a number of radio interviews recently on this. And it would be so much easier for me to speak in declarative sentences about how I could, I could probably leverage that to make a bigger splash as a pundit, but I'm unwilling to, because, I, because I, I probably believe in, you know, in nuance and all but it, it's, it's, you see it happen, you know, you're like, I know, and I, I see this all the time, like, there's the two-minute version of this that would sound really compelling and be good enough 
to get by, and and that is what's happening in those places. I, I think they're. It's not that they're terrible. They're they're useful in a way, but they are almost doing some violence to some of what we're doing. But uh, it's the French, it's the fragility point. As soon as it's, yeah. it's the larger conversation that puts it all together, it's easier to undermine that. Some strength that one of the studies isn't replicated. You know, yep. The larger picture sticks together. Yeah. You don't have that when it's so silent. And people throw their hands up and say, "Yeah." So, great. I know we're out of time. Thank yeah. You. yeah. All right. Thank you so much for coming. Thank yeah. you, Brian. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.